This town is strange. Residents lock themselves indoors before nightfall. Each house has a talisman hanging on the wall near the door. One day, Frank, a local, becomes heavily intoxicated. Despite his friend's attempts to rouse him and send him home before dark, Frank is too drunk to respond. As dusk approaches, Frank's wife, Lauren, anxiously awaits his return. When he doesn't show up, she locks the door. As their daughter is about to fall asleep, she hears a woman's voice outside the window, claiming to be her grandmother. The old woman lures the girl to open the window. Before Lauren can intervene, the girl opens the window, leading to an attack by the monster. The next day, upon Frank's return, he discovers a crowd outside his house. Sheriff Boyd reproaches him, slapping him for disregarding safety measures. For houses with children, the protocol is nailing windows shut. Frank neglected this, resulting in the brutal killing of his wife and daughter by the monsters, who devoured all their organs. On the other hand, we meet a family of four, Tabitha, Jim, and their kids, Julie and Ethan. The couple's relationship appears strained. As they travel in their RV, a massive tree on the road forces them to stop in the middle of the highway. Stepping out, they witness crows gathering in an eerie manner prompting them to retreat into the RV and opt for a detour. Unfortunately, they stumble upon the same town plagued by nighttime monster attacks. The town feels creepy to them. All car tires are flat, and people avoid conversation. Following the funeral for Lorena and her daughter, the townsfolk return home, ignoring Jim as if he's invisible. Jim turns to Boyd, seeking guidance on how to get back on the highway. Boyd advises sticking to the road and driving. Much to Jim and Tabitha's dismay, they find themselves back in the town. Assuming they missed a turn, they continue driving, but even after three attempts, they repeatedly end up back in the same unsettling town. On their fourth attempt, their RV collides with a car, leading to a crash. Toby, the car's driver, heads to the town to seek help. Meanwhile, Boyd and Deputy Kenny have decided it's time to reveal the town's truth to the family. They strategically place spikes on the road to stop the RV. However, upon learning about the accident from Toby, Boyd rushes to the crash site and discovers another car passenger, Jade, high on drugs. To prevent Jade from disappearing into the forest, Boyd secures his hand to the car door with handcuffs. He then turns his attention to the family in the RV and finds Jim stuck, Tabitha unconscious, and Ethan injured with a table leg piercing his thigh. Christy, the town's only doctor and a third-year medical student, arrives to provide treatment. With darkness approaching, Boyd instructs his son Ellis to escort Tabitha and Julie back to town, while he, Jim, and Christy stay in the RV to remove the table leg from Ethan's thigh. Boyd takes precautionary measures before nightfall, such as hanging a talisman in the RV and covering windows with blankets. Meanwhile, as Kenny and Ellis transport Julie and Tabitha to town, their truck's tires go flat due to the earlier stripped spike. Simultaneously, the RV becomes surrounded by monsters. Due to the trauma from the accident, Ethan begins convulsing, but Christy manages to attend to him. When Boyd mentions that the people are coming, Jim assumes they are residents of the town. In a desperate attempt to save his son, Jim tries to unlock the doors. However, Boyd intervenes, gripping him by the neck and clarifying that they are not dealing with humans. Once Jim calms down and questions what they are up against, Boyd admits he doesn't know. All they understand is that hanging the talisman near the door and keeping the windows shut prevents these entities from entering and causing harm. Meanwhile, Kenny and the others sprint towards the colony house. Heavy rain hampers their speed, making it challenging to run. The darkness adds to the danger, as they could be attacked by monsters at any moment. Finally, they reach the colony house. They pound on the door and urge those inside to open up. However, it's a strict rule not to open doors at night under any circumstances. Donna, one of the town's oldest members, makes the decision to allow them in, knowing that Ellis and the group went to rescue people. Just in time, before the monsters strike, Donna opens the door and lets them in. On the other hand, Jim attempts to unlock the window after hearing voices from outside. Boyd intervenes, asserting that with the talisman in the RV, the only way these entities can enter is if they allow them. Simultaneously, Donna decides to disclose the town's truth to Tabitha. It appears that everyone arriving here has witnessed a fallen tree followed by a flock of ravens in the sky. As it's Tabitha's first night, she struggles to comprehend the entire situation. Meanwhile, inside the RV, Ethan regains consciousness. He shares with his father a dream where he saw numerous drawings on the wall. In the town, a room matching Ethan's description is revealed, and Victor, 
the town's eeriest character, is shown as the artist behind all the drawings. Tragedy strikes as the nurse of Christie's clinic discovers Toby's lifeless body on the bed. Shockingly, it is revealed that Sarah, a worker at the diner, killed him, and left the door ajar. This enables the monsters to infiltrate the clinic, resulting in the death of everyone inside. Among the victims is Kenny's father, who was in the clinic due to dementia and other health issues. After cleaning herself of the blood, Sarah seeks comfort and embraces her brother. The next day, when Kenny returns to the clinic, he is devastated to find his father's lifeless body on the floor, with all his organs devoured by the monsters. Overwhelmed with emotion, Kenny has an outburst. Boyd approaches him, informing him that Father Catry is taking the family back to the colony house. Kenny objects, stating they shouldn't be there, but Boyd reveals it's just for one night. Ethan's wound has been treated, and he is now in the colony house with his family. The situation takes an eerie turn, when Ethan spots a boy in a white dress outside the colony house, smiling at him. A day later, Jade finally regains consciousness. Upon realizing he's tied to the bed, he threatens Donna to release him. Donna then proceeds to tell him the entire story of nightly monster hunts, and the village residents never leaving the place. Jade, however, bursts into laughter, convinced that the town is an elaborate escape room orchestrated by his friend Toby. Without listening further to Donna, he heads outside, treating the situation like a puzzle to solve. Meanwhile, Father Catry discusses the choosing ceremony with Jim and Tabitha. All newcomers must decide whether to reside in the colony house or down in the town. Boyd expresses concern about Frank's fate. The people of the village live by the rules that are meant to protect each other and keep each other safe. When someone's actions or negligence results in a resident's death, the sole punishment is a night in the box. Boyd informs Frank that whatever occurs tonight is not personal, and Frank seems to understand him. After visiting the box, Boyd talks to Father Catry about forgiving Frank. He says that he built the box as a deterrent to scare people. However, Father Catry argues that they had warned Frank multiple times. Forgiving him now could lead to a strong negative reaction from the community. It will potentially result in frequent mistakes and a disregard for the rules from the people. Later, Father Catry guides Tabitha and Jim through town, showcasing the house where they can reside if they opt to live there. It turns out to be Frank's house, with the room where Lauren died still bearing blood splatters. This sight terrifies Tabitha, but Jim consoles her. He emphasizes that this is their new reality, and they must adapt to it. Meanwhile, Jade continues exploring the town, searching for clues to solve what he believes is an escape room. Venturing away, he discovers a basement. While exploring, he comes across a door. Upon opening it, he finds a deceased man pinned under a giant boulder. The man suddenly emits a demonic scream, scaring the hell out of Jade. Jade swiftly exits the basement and applauds Toby's supposed efforts, still convinced it's all part of the game. Back in the colony house, Ellis crafts a walking aid for Ethan. As Ethan explores the area, he encounters Victor and strikes up a conversation, inquiring about what Victor is doing. Victor sternly instructs Ethan to stay away from him. However, when Ethan brings up the boy in the white dress, Victor becomes intrigued. It appears he also possesses knowledge about the mysterious boy. Before Ethan departs, Victor instructs him to convey greetings if he encounters the boy again. The choosing ceremony begins, offering Jim's family the option to select a stone if they want to stay in town, or a flower if they prefer the colony house. Contrary to Jim and Tabitha, Julie decides to live in the colony house, sparking anger from her parents. They are upset and concerned about her well-being. Boyd assures them that she will be taken care of. Subsequently, Boyd attempts to persuade the people to reconsider Frank's punishment. However, Frank himself intervenes, expressing his desire to face the consequences of his actions. He desperately wants to reunite with his daughter and wife whom he lost due to his negligence. Witnessing these events, Jade continues to believe the town's residents are actors. He praises their performance. However, Kenny takes him to the graveyard and reveals Toby's lifeless body, finally making Jade realize that Donna's words are true and that he is indeed trapped in a town from which no one can escape. Eventually, Frank is confined to the box. Soon after, the monsters join him, ending his life then and there. The next day, Boyd carries Frank's body and transports it to the graveyard. Along the way, he encounters Ethan, who inquires about what's in the cart. Evading the question, Boyd mentions it holds some supplies. Upon delivering the body to the graveyard, 
As he's about to depart, Father Catry questions why Boyd is leaving instead of participating in the memorial service. Boyd scuffs at Catry, saying that the words come from the person who was against saving Frank. Recognizing that Boyd carries a sense of responsibility for the recent deaths in town, Father Catry approaches him and urges him not to blame himself. He further adds that it is Boyd who discovered the talisman, while also establishing some sort of order in the chaos. He apologizes for the cost Boyd has paid, but emphasizes that the town needs him now more than ever. Before leaving, he suggests not letting her death be for nothing, suggesting he might be talking about Boyd's wife. Overwhelmed by the stress of the situation, Boyd vents his frustration by screaming at himself in the mirror. On the other hand, Tabitha arrives at the colony house to give Julie her sweater. An argument ensues between the two. It is revealed that Tabitha and Jim decided to get a divorce, and this trip marked their final one together as a family. Additionally, Tabitha had lost her baby boy, causing a rift in their relationship. Julie is enraged at her mother for clinging to the memories of her deceased son and not taking care of those who are alive. Later, while Jim and Ethan are having breakfast at the diner, Ethan inquires if they are on a quest like the ones he hears in stories. Tired of lying to his son and pretending to be strong in front of him, Jim excuses himself to the restroom, where he breaks down in tears. While he is in the restroom, Ethan is approached by Victor, who informs him that the tree around his house has moved four inches inward. Victor kept this information to himself, fearing no one would believe him. Showing Ethan a drawing of a boy, Victor asks if it's the same boy Ethan has been seeing. When Ethan admits to seeing the boy, Victor discloses that the boy has been absent for a long time, and now they need to find out why he's returned. Finding Victor near Ethan, Jim becomes infuriated and warns him to stay away from his son. Jade explores the basement, the same one from which Victor emerged as a child. Taking Kenny inside, Jade recounts how he saw a body and a sign on the ceiling. Concerned that Jade might be losing his sanity, Kenny brings him to his office to help him grasp the reality of their situation. Kenny explains that newcomers typically fear only the monsters, assuming that's the main challenge. However, he believes the real challenge is how the place affects them, driving those who refuse to adapt to insanity. In contrast, Jade insists that someone is manipulating them, and he won't stop until he unravels the mystery behind what's happening. On the other hand, as Jim and Tabitha argue outside the house, Victor approaches Ethan from the backside and leads him into the forest to search for the mysterious boy. While exploring, Victor recounts being the first person to arrive in the town. Upon getting out of the basement, he discovered half-eaten corpses scattered around. Only the boy in the white dress and his dog were there. While conversing, Victor spots the boy nearby. As they search for him, they come across a tree Victor calls a faraway tree. To illustrate, he draws a smiling face on a rock and tosses it into the tree. After a moment, the stone falls right behind them, revealing the tree's ability to teleport objects or even humans. However, they can never know where they will end up. Suddenly, Victor hears the sounds of a dog barking, the same dog he saw with the boy. Unable to locate Ethan, his parents enter the forest, but find themselves surrounded by dogs. Before the dogs can harm them, Victor fires a shot into the air, causing the dogs to retreat. The parents are relieved to find their son. To ensure that it doesn't happen again, Jim voices his concerns to Boyd about Victor's behavior. As Victor resides in the colony house, they must address the issue with Donna. Boyd assures Jim that he'll speak to her and ensure Victor refrains from such actions. To ease tensions, Boyd invites Jim to dinner. While at the diner, Sarah experiences severe arm pain, accompanied by the words kill the boy engraved on her arm. As the inscription vanishes, Sarah collapses and begins convulsing. On the other hand, residents of the colony house are alarmed by Victor's actions. When questioned, he reveals that he's digging graves and preparing in advance, instilling fear among the community. In the meantime, upon learning about Sarah's condition, her brother Nathan rushes towards the clinic. Inside, Christy is attending to Sarah. Boyd questions Christy about the possibility of physical reactions to the town, citing Ethan's seizures as an example. During their discussion, Christy observes Boyd's hand trembling. Although Boyd claims to be fine, Christy insists he comes for a detailed examination the next day. Nathan arrives at the clinic, but Boyd denies him entry stating that Sarah is resting. In reality, Sarah doesn't want to see her brother at the moment. Nathan remains concerned about Sarah, 
Ever since she confessed to killing Toby and leaving the door open for the monsters to enter, on the other hand, Sarah spends the night at the clinic. During this time, she steals a scalpel to fulfill the task dictated by the voices she hears. It becomes a sort of girl's night for Sarah and Christy. Amid their conversation, Christy discloses that she had a partner named Mariel back home. Sarah, testing the waters, asks Christy if she would be willing to do something really bad, yet something that could allow all of them to go home. Unaware of Sarah's true intentions, Christy responds affirmatively. The next day, as Sarah exits the clinic, she is approached by Nathan. Concerned about her well-being, Nathan expresses worry, but Sarah assures him that she is okay and that he doesn't need to fret. Meanwhile, Jim hands his wife a pen and suggests that she write down any questions she has about the place on the wall. Though she has a question, she refuses to take part in the activity, saying that it is crazy, and she doesn't want to know the answer. On the other hand, Sarah, having stolen a scalpel from the clinic, visits Tabitha at her residence and takes Ethan outside to play with him. After a while, she proposes taking Ethan to the barn to show him chickens and goats. Tabitha agrees, but she decides to accompany them. On the other hand, Nathan approaches Father Catry and asks him about the protocols for making a confession. Obtaining a promise that it will remain between them and God, Nathan reveals everything about Sarah. Upon hearing this story, Father Catry becomes alarmed, recognizing that people's lives are in danger as long as Sarah is among them. Without delay, the duo make their way towards the diner. At the barn, Sarah informs Tabitha about hidden places in the town where they can seek refuge if they find themselves outside after dark. To demonstrate, she guides Tabitha inside and locks her in a closet. Her focus then shifts to Ethan. She comes up to him and tells him that she likes him and that whatever she will do next is for the greater good. As she attempts to harm Ethan, Nathan arrives just in time to intervene and stop her. Seizing the opportunity, Ethan kicks Sarah and escapes. Nathan tries to restrain Sarah and wrest the scalpel from her. Tragically, Sarah inadvertently slashes Nathan's throat, leading to his untimely demise. Before Father Catry arrives at the scene, Nathan had already succumbed to his injuries. As the villagers gather at the barn, Jim arrives as well. Upon hearing Tabitha's screams from inside the building, he rushes in and unlocks the door. Together, they hurry outside to search for Ethan, who has fortunately found safety after fleeing and encountering Julie along the way. Christy examines Nathan and sadly confirms his demise. Father Catry and Boyd then talk to Jim, stating that Sarah has fled into the woods. They decide that if she returns before nightfall, they will punish her, but if she doesn't, they'll leave it to the monsters to deal with her. Returning home, Tabitha finally decides to write her question on the wall. She wonders if they even survived the crash. Amidst all the chaos, Jade is deeply absorbed in his own thoughts, fixated on finding ways to escape this place. Holding a radio he took from Kenny's office, he heads to the makeshift bar, where Tom is serving vodka made from potatoes. Jade is taken aback by how people have come to accept their fate and live as if nothing has happened. In his eyes, they resemble rats in a maze, contentedly nibbling on their cheese. Overwhelmed by this situation, Jade vents his frustration at the bar. Tom calms him down and suggests that if he's determined to make a change, he should figure out how to get the radio broadcasting. This way, they can potentially communicate with the outside world. The idea resonates with Jade, especially considering his background as a software engineer. On the other hand, Boyd visits his wife's grave and confides in her about his tremors. He explains that he's contemplating escaping the town to find a way to return the people home. However, he fears that if his plan fails, he'll be leaving the people in an even worse situation than they already face. Seeking guidance, he asks for a sign on how to proceed. After his visit, Boyd returns to the diner, where he finds Christy blaming herself for Sarah killing Nathan. She believes that consulting with Sarah that night could have prevented the tragedy. Boyd reassures her that it isn't her fault, emphasizing the many lives she has saved. When the radio suddenly comes to life, he interprets it as a sign from his wife encouraging his escape plan. It's not just the fact that the radio starts working, but the specific tune, if I had a boat, solidifies the sign. Meanwhile, Jade starts working on setting up the radio broadcast. He disconnects an antenna from a car, preparing to pick up signals. Simultaneously, Jim conducts his own research and discovers something unusual in the house. The cords lack wires, making it difficult for them to determine the source of electricity. While he is discussing this with Tabitha, Jade enters their house and seeks Jim's assistance in making the radio function, 
Considering his engineering background, to acquire more wires, the pair heads to Jade's car and removes essential components. However, they are perplexed to find that someone has already removed the battery. As Jim works on finding an escape from the town, Tabitha cleans the house and discovers belongings left behind by the previous residents. She takes the box to the diner, where Kenny's mother, Miss Lou, guides her to a room filled with items from the town's former inhabitants. While placing the box there, Tabitha comes across a bracelet. She is astonished to see it, as it appears to belong to her. Back at the house, Tabitha decides to trace the origin of the electric wires. When a lamp repeatedly turns on and off, she decides to dismantle the wall where the lamp's outlet is. Meanwhile, Jim ventures into the forest with Jade, searching for the tallest tree to install the antenna. As he ascends, Jade starts connecting the radio. Suddenly, as Jade places his hand on the tree, blood begins to pour. The same symbol Jade often sees is once again seen engraved on the tree. In the midst of this, blood starts dripping on him, and when he looks up, he discovers bodies hanging from the tree. To add to the shock, a soldier emerges, wielding a gun, and shooting at Jade. In a state of panic, he flees deeper into the forest with the soldier in pursuit. Eventually, the man catches Jade, and ends his life with the bayonet of the gun. However, it is revealed that it was merely a vision that Jade was experiencing. Hearing Jade's screams, Jim approaches him, and manages to calm him down. Upon realizing it was not a real event, Jade becomes both confused and distressed. Ever since encountering that mysterious symbol, he compulsively draws it everywhere in an attempt to comprehend its significance. At the diner, Miss Lou offers him a cup of coffee. Upon seeing the sign, she leads Jade to a room and presents a book from one of the town's former residents. Surprisingly, identical symbols are sketched in the book, reassuring Jade that he isn't merely hallucinating. Meanwhile, Jim struggles to secure a signal but picks up static motivating him to persist in his efforts. Upon returning home, Jim discovers sizable holes in the walls. Exploring the basement, he finds Tabitha actively digging into the ground. When questioned, she discloses that all the house wires lead directly downward. When Jim finds it a bit odd, Tabitha tells him about the bracelet she found. It turns out she had crafted the bracelet for Jim during their early days of dating, but he lost it at the hospital the night Julie was born. Jim considers the possibility that it could be a similar bracelet to theirs, but Tabitha points out a flaw she made in creating it, identical to the mistake in her own lost bracelet. Realizing that Tabitha isn't merely going crazy digging in the basement, Jim decides to assist her in unraveling the mystery behind the wire's destination. Later, Father Catry delivers a homily to the townspeople. After the sermon, Tabitha approaches him and hands over pages she found in her house containing words from the Bible. As there was no actual Bible in the town, Father Catry decided to transcribe whatever he could recall from the book. Tabitha then inquires of Father Catry whether they are alive or dead from the crash. In response, Father Catry asserts that it doesn't matter if they are dead or alive. The undeniable truth is that they are trapped in this town, which is attacked by monsters every night. Determining whether they are alive or dead won't alter the challenges they face. Nevertheless, to reassure Tabitha, he affirms that she is very much alive, considering they were already in the town before the crash. After Tabitha departs, Father Catry heads to the church's basement, where he is Sarah tied to a chair. It is disclosed that he had lied to others by claiming Sarah had escaped into the forest. He informs her that despite the terrible things she has done, there is still an opportunity for her to assist the people of the town. He continues by informing Sarah that the Bible actually consists of 73 books. He believes that since the night he arrived in the town, he has been contemplating the idea that the people of this town might be living a book yet to be written. He urges her to share details about the voices she hears. Recognizing Father Catry's belief in her, Sarah begins to recount how the voices expressed a desire to help them. According to the voices, they have been present for a long time, waiting for someone who could hear them and aid in their escape. As Sarah continues describing the voices to Father Catry, she adds that the voices claim to be similar to them. They revealed information, things they couldn't possibly know. They even foretold the arrival of the two cars. The voices asserted that if she followed their instructions, everyone would get to go home. Father Catry then questions Sarah about her belief in these voices. Sarah responds that they promised that Nathan would be okay, but now, with Nathan gone, she doesn't know if she can trust them. Father Catry responds that if the voices are real, it means Sarah is connected to this place in a way that no one else is. He decides that once they find a way to prove that the voices are not merely a product of a troubled mind, 
they will disclose this information to others. As soon as Father Katri makes this decision, Sarah experiences intense pain. She requests paper, and after a while, she draws a symbol on it, telling Father Katri that the voices wanted her to show him something. According to the voices, they observed Father Katri burying a bag on the day he arrived, and this serves as proof of their existence. Upon hearing this, Father Katri is profoundly shocked. He immediately goes to the location where he buried the bag. Upon opening it, he discovers a bottle of alcohol, a blood-stained shirt, and a chocolate bar with a character resembling the one Sarah drew. Now, Father Katri realizes that Sarah isn't simply insane. She truly receives instructions from voices. On the other hand, Boyd confides in Kenny about his plan. He explains that the reason they haven't ventured deeper into the forest is the uncertainty about whether the talisman would provide the same protection outside the town as it does within. Now, with the talisman safeguarding them in the RV, Boyd believes he can utilize it on his journey into the forest to find a way out. Kenny doesn't react positively to the news, indicating he might not want to lose his sheriff. Especially after losing his father, he advises Boyd that if he wants to die, he should do it here. With that, Kenny leaves the area, recognizing that Kenny might need a father figure more than a sheriff during this challenging time. Boyd approaches him and reveals that he is unwell. It turns out that Boyd's father was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when he was around Boyd's age, starting with tremors in his hands. While the disease is not supposed to be hereditary, Boyd acknowledges that he will soon get it and will be unable to protect the people of the town. Despite this, he believes he still has to find a way out while he can. Upon hearing Boyd's explanation, Kenny understands the urgency of the situation and grants him permission to journey into the forest. Meanwhile, in the colony house, Julie discovers a bouquet of flowers on the porch. She brings them inside and places them in a vase. During the night, while everyone else is asleep, resident Kevin goes to the bathroom and pulls back the curtain from the window. On the other side of the window stands a monster holding the same bouquet, revealing that it is Kevin who leaves it for her outside the house. They have been friends for a long time. The monster now implores Kevin to let her inside, but he tells her that he can't. The next day, the residents at the colony house celebrate the one-year anniversary of Flora's arrival in the town. While Julie finds it odd to celebrate being stuck in a town, Flora sees it differently. For her, it's a celebration of their survival in the town. On that day, Kevin once again leaves the bouquet on the porch. Before nightfall, Father Catry approaches Boyd and expresses a desire to talk. As they head inside, he shows Boyd the bag he buried when he first came to the town. When asked about the blood on a shirt, Father Catry discloses a painful memory of being unable to save a boy from his abusive father. The boy wanted to stay in the church, but Father Catry sent him home, claiming to have work to do. Instead of providing comfort, he gave the boy a bar of chocolate. After some time, he noticed the boy's mother rushing out of the house. Upon entering, he discovered the lifeless body of the boy, while the abusive father insisted that his son would be fine. Enraged, Father Catry began punching the man in the face until he bled. When Boyd questions why Father Catry is sharing this story now, he discloses that he is Sarah tied up in the basement of the church. In response, Boyd holds him at gunpoint, furious at him for breaking the rules. However, Father Catry explains how the voices in Sarah's head reveal information that no one else knows. This revelation eventually calms Boyd. Father Catry then establishes a connection between Boyd's journey into the forest and the newfound understanding of the voices Sarah hears. He believes that by working together, they might discover a way out of this town. Meanwhile, at the colony house, the residents celebrate Flora's one-year anniversary. Donna praises Flora for her efforts in taking care of everyone and maintaining a positive attitude throughout her stay. While the members are engrossed in the festivities, Kevin goes to the bathroom to converse with his monster girlfriend. This time, the girl has come to bid farewell to Kevin, expressing that she can't endure the pain of being near him without being able to feel him. Yielding to her emotional words, Kevin opens the window and lets her in. The two share an embrace. Everything seems fine, until the girl scratches Kevin's back with her sharp nails. To make matters worse, she pulls out his tongue and ends his life on the spot. She then opens the window to allow other monsters inside the house. Meanwhile, the residents of the colony house continue to party, oblivious to what's about to unfold. In contrast, Ellis is feeling low because when he reflects on how he has survived, he also remembers those he lost in the process, particularly his mother. Frustrated, 
He vents his emotions on a fellow resident. After comforting him, Sarah approaches another resident, Trudy, who is also sad. To lift her spirits, Sarah gives her sweater to Trudy, reassuring her that everything will be alright. On the other hand, a distressed Julie seeks solace in Victor's room for some alone time. Unlike other rooms in the colony house, Victor's room remains unoccupied. There, she discovers Victor preparing to leave. Meanwhile, Trudy goes to the bathroom only to discover that the monsters have infiltrated the house. Before she can react or scream, the monsters attack her, ending her life. In another part of the colony house, residents are sitting and relaxing when they notice blood dripping from above. Upon looking up, they are horrified to see a smiling monster. Soon, the monsters launch an attack killing the residents one by one. Reacting quickly, Donna urges the remaining residents to evacuate the house and get into the van. Flora informs Donna that Ellis is still inside and might be unaware of the monster attack. Hearing the commotion, Ellis descends only to find blood everywhere. Spotting a woman in a yellow sweater, he initially believes it's his girlfriend, Flora. However, his relief is short-lived when a monster joins the scene. Acting swiftly, Ellis breaks the bathroom window and escapes outside. With the monster closing in, he is left with no choice but to jump off the building. Meanwhile, Donna led the residents to safety. In a desperate move, Flora brings Ellis inside, locking the door on both sides and relying solely on the talisman to keep the monsters at bay. Fortunately, the plan works, and she and Ellis manage to survive the attack. Meanwhile, upon hearing the sounds of monsters, Victor quickly improvises a rope and throws it out of the window. He then gives Julie a bunch of drawings he arranged together. With the rope, the duo manages to leave the room. As the monsters take over the colony house, and Victor observes a white-dressed boy heading into the forest, he decides to follow him. Although Julie is frightened to go with him, she has no other option. Eventually, they reach a faraway tree. Victor encourages Julie to trust him and enter the tree. Left with no alternative, Julie follows his instructions, and the next thing she knows, she is in a giant cabinet in a root cellar. Father Catry and Boyd are having their discussion, when they hear the sound of a van approaching, they quickly head outside to assist the panicked residents of the colony house to safety. While helping, Father Catry is attacked by a monster. Boyd shoots the monster, allowing him to bring Father Catry back inside. Due to a severe neck wound, Father Catry bleeds to death. Meanwhile, Jim discusses with Tabitha about getting static on the radio. Their next plan involves seeking permission from Donna to erect a tower on higher ground at the colony house. Tabitha appreciates her husband's efforts and embraces him, hopeful that one day everything will be alright. The following day brings more challenges for the townspeople, as they must make space for the residents of the colony house. Until the broken windows and doors are repaired, the newcomers will stay in the town. This raises concerns among the townspeople, who fear the newcomers might deplete their ration. Boyd steps in to calm them down, instructing everyone to support each other in this time of need. He plans to embark on his journey as early as possible. Kinney suggests that Boyd should address the townspeople before departing, keeping them informed about his plan. However, Boyd believes that Kenny, being the next in line for sheriff, should learn how to handle the people and convince them, as he may be the one dealing with such situations in the future. Before departing, Boyd goes to the church's basement and brings Sarah to the forest. Though he doesn't completely trust her, he decides to give Father Catry's idea a chance. To prevent Sarah from being seen by the townspeople, he leads her to a shed in the forest and instructs her to stay there until he returns. Sarah assures him that she won't go anywhere, as she wants to help people just as much as he does. In a flashback, it is revealed how Boyd ended up in the town. He was on a trip with his marine wife, Abby, and their son, Ellis, when they encountered the fallen tree on the road. Reversing the car, they inadvertently entered the creepiest town in the country just as night was falling. While they were passing through the town, Father Catry stopped them, warning them that they needed to exit the car if they wanted to survive. Initially perceiving Father Catry as a threat, the couple opted to drive away. However, the approaching sounds of monsters made them reconsider, realizing that Father Catry might be telling the truth. They chose to trust him, while keeping a gun pointed at him, prepared for any situation. Inside the hole, they encountered Donna and others. Father Catry promised to explain everything once daylight arrived. While in the hole, Boyd and his terrified family could hear the screams of people and the sounds of monsters devouring them. The following day, upon emerging from the hole, 
they discovered half-eaten corpses scattered on the road. Realizing the reality of the town and understanding the necessity of adapting to the situation, Boyd proposed to Father Catry and Donna that they should gather resources, establish a system, and ensure everyone's safety at night. Drawing upon his 30 years of military service, Boyd had ideas on how to effectively manage the challenges of the town. Once they inventoried their resources, they began rationing them out. Boyd also decided to dig more holes to prevent anyone from hiding in the same place twice. Before him, nobody dared to venture out into the forest. When Boyd finally did, he discovered a goat and chickens. Father Catry was astonished to realize that what they couldn't achieve in months, Boyd accomplished in days. However, Boyd became so immersed in leading the townspeople, that he forgot his family needed him during this challenging time. When he decided to go back into the forest to acquire some chickens, Ellis stopped him, insisting that Abby needed him the most. Boyd promised his son that he would return home that night, and they could talk about it. However, fate had other plans. As Boyd headed into the forest to find more livestock, he stumbled upon a German shepherd. Observing a collar on the dog's neck, Boyd realized that its owner might be nearby, and they could possibly find a way out. He followed the dog, only to become lost in the forest. As darkness fell, Boyd heard the approaching voices of monsters. While evading one of the monsters, he stumbled into a cave. To his fortune, the monsters retreated instead of attacking him. Surveying the cave, he discovered numerous talismans, leading him to believe that these stones provided protection from the monsters. Gathering as many as he could, he returned to the town. Upon his return, he found everyone running for their lives. It turned out that Abby had become delusional, convinced that their reality was a dream, and killing someone wouldn't result in their death. Boyd tried to intervene, but Abby persisted, insisting they needed to wake up from the dream. As she aimed her pistol at Ellis, Boyd had no choice but to shoot her, resulting in her demise. Ellis held his father responsible for Abby's death, believing that if Boyd had spent more time with her, she wouldn't have become insane. In the present day, Boyd opts not to leave the town due to the recent riot among the people, he believes they need him the most at this moment. Kenny disagrees, insisting that Boyd must go, and put an end to the suffering of the people once and for all. He reminds Boyd of the urgency he expressed earlier, emphasizing the need to act swiftly before things worsen. Donna overhears Kenny discussing Boyd's departure, and when asked, Boyd opens up to her about his journey into the forest. Before embarking on his journey, Boyd visits Ellis and shares his travel plans. Ellis describes his plan as aimless wandering, recalling how well it worked out for them last time. Boyd tells Ellis that he may never return and that he shouldn't leave things unsaid. Boyd admits to being proud of the person Ellis has become. As he leaves, Donna reassures Boyd that Ellis will be fine, thanking him for looking out for his son. Donna acknowledges the significant contributions Boyd has made to the town. Flora consoles Ellis, assuring him that what happened isn't his fault. She points out that he has been venting his frustration on Boyd for months, while Boyd has silently carried the burden. Ellis has come to realize that Boyd did everything in his power to protect his family and the people of the town. Reflecting on the past, he acknowledges that if Boyd hadn't ventured into the forest that day and discovered the talisman, he and Flora might not have survived the previous attack. Ellis finally embraces his father, apologizing for everything he said over the past few months. During their interaction, Ellis notices Sarah. Though he has questions, Boyd helps him understand that she won't pose a threat now, and he plans to enlist her assistance in finding a way out. Back in the town, Julie has left the basement where the tree teleported her. She recounts to her parents how Victor mentioned that it was beginning. When she describes the tree to her parents, Ethan inquires if it was a faraway tree recalling having seen such a tree on a previous expedition into the woods with Victor. Overwhelmed by memories of the previous attack, Julie breaks down in tears. Learning about how Julie and Victor fled from the colony house, Jade arrives at Jim's place to inquire about Victor's whereabouts. Jim becomes furious, as Julie is already distressed, and Jade's questions are only worsening the situation. Jade explains to Jim that he found a picture in a book showing a young Victor passing by the diner. Upon hearing about the static Jim received from the radio, the duo heads to the colony house to seek Donna's permission. They propose building a tower on the roof of the colony house since it is the highest point on the hill. Their idea is to broadcast a signal that anyone in the area could pick up. Believing that former colony house residents may not be willing to return after the recent chaos, Donna grants them permission to proceed with their plan. Later, Kenny addresses the townspeople, informing them about Boyd's journey into the forest. 
Donovan updates the residents on Jim and Jade's plan. Jim adds that to implement their plan, they will need batteries or anything with a charge. To assist Jade and Jim with their project, everyone heads to the colony house. Boyd and Sarah are making their way through the forest. Sarah keeps inquiring about where they're going. Boyd becomes increasingly angry, believing that she is doubting his leadership. Soon, they reach the spot where Boyd found talismans. Sarah believes they should venture further, but Boyd isn't willing to test their luck any further. He decides to spend the night in a cave, hoping to continue their journey the next day. On the following day, they resume exploring the forest. Boyd, demonstrating his intelligence, carves directions on the trees to make their way back easier. Amid their search for a way out, Boyd questions Sarah about whether the voices that instructed her to kill everyone were telling the truth. Sarah prefers not to discuss the murders, emphasizing that she only wanted to save others. However, Boyd becomes infuriated, insisting that she has no choice but to answer his questions. Reluctantly, Sarah reveals how the voices informed her about the arrival of two cars, and warned that if she didn't kill Ethan, everyone would die. Sarah questions Boyd about why he didn't put her in the box. Sensing her distress, Boyd uncuffs her, trying to calm her down. They continue their journey until they reach a tree with many glass bottles hanging from it. As Boyd tries to collect the bottles, Sarah begins hearing voices again. Unable to endure the pain, she starts convulsing. Meanwhile, the radio broadcasting project is divided into three parts. One large group is building the tower, while two smaller groups work on the radio and the power source. Donna is upset, as everything she built seems to be falling apart and she's further stressed by the death of a colony house resident who attempted suicide. Later, Kenny visits Christy, who is also feeling low after losing her patient. Kenny updates Jim on the progress. Jim, seemingly pleased, informs Kenny of the need for more wood to erect the tower. While conversing with Ellis, Flora expresses her concerns about the tower project not being successful. The idea that the project might work is scarier for her than the possibility of its failure. Flora believes that even if they manage to return home, their lives won't be as normal as they once were. She thinks that after everything they have seen and everything they have done, they won't be able to forget it. Additionally, she ponders how their relationships will be once they return home. Meanwhile, Jim and Jay discuss the town's old battery supply. Most batteries are well past their expiration date, and they will only last a couple of hours. They need a power source that can broadcast the radio for several days. As they converse, Donna storms into the kitchen, wielding an axe. She begins tearing apart the wooden floor, to provide Jim with a fresh supply of wooden planks for his tower. Kenny attempts to calm her down, but she is too distressed to listen. Donna is upset because Kenny and his team were so engrossed in their new project, that they are not considering the consequences if their plan fails. Donna tries to relax in the bar, but Kenny approaches her there, attempting to comfort her. However, Donna is still enraged at him. She suggests he has no idea what life was like before Boyd and the Talisman. She says the town was a functioning community until they started their radio broadcasting project. Donna believes that Kenny, Jim, and Jade have raised people's hopes so high that if it is taken away, they will be lost. Eventually, they will give up and die. After venting out her frustration, she tells Kenny that she will put on her game face tomorrow and focus on the tower project. Jim faces setbacks due to a lack of batteries. Jade suggests finding Victor, thinking he might know something about the sign Jim often sees. Jim isn't thrilled with the idea. He wants to focus on a more practical solution. Later, Ellis approaches Jim, informing him that the team has gathered enough wire stripped for the cord. On the other hand, Jade keeps complaining about not knowing the answer to the problem, considering himself a genius. Tired of his constant whining, Miss Louie shows him that he can take electricity from the lamp. Initially, Jade argues, stating that none of the outlets work. However, he suddenly gets an idea, indicating he might have found a solution to their problem. After finishing some work in the basement, Tabitha heads upstairs, only to find that the stairs seem never-ending. Later, she sees Jim hanging upside down and screaming, but fortunately, it's just a dream. Upon Jim's return from the colony house, Julie asks him to help them dig the basement. While digging, Tabitha senses something solid, like concrete, beneath the mud. It appears she is close to discovering the source of the electricity wires. In the woods, Boyd and Sarah take refuge in a camping tent, securing a talisman at the tent's door zippers. When Sarah wakes up, Boyd informs her that he found a bottle, 
but inside is a paper with the year 1864 written on it. Sarah suggests they go back because the voice she heard was from a woman who was screaming and admitting she was wrong. The woman warned them not to stay, as things outside are worse than the monsters. Sarah mentions the woman kept saying, tell Mr. Fish and Loaves that I was wrong. Hearing the name, Boyd seems shocked. As they talk, the tent starts shaking as if someone is shaking it outside. After the struggle, Boyd notices the talisman has come loose. He searches for it, and reattaches it to the rope hanging in the center of the tent. Suddenly, a light illuminates the tent, but it comes and goes, making it challenging for Boyd and Sarah to understand what it is. The next day, as they emerge from the tent, they discover they are surrounded by giant spider webs. As they continue their journey, Sarah questions their destination. Boyd responds that they're going to follow the light. She reminds him of what she told him the previous night. Brushing off her fears, Boyd suggests heading toward the searchlight, believing it might be part of something important. Sarah warns that there could be something worse at the light. When she inquires about Mr. Fish and Loaves, Boyd confesses that it's his nickname from the service. Sarah suspects that the voice reaching out to her the other night might be Boyd's wife, Abby. Suddenly, Boyd hears a woman screaming for help. Frantically searching for her, he discovers Abby wrapped in a web. Unexpectedly, Abby attacks him, revealing that it was just one of those visions. The disturbance causes the spiders to break out of the hive. As Boyd removes the spiders from his back, Sarah asks what he saw, but he doesn't respond. Due to the spider bites, Boyd collapses on the ground in pain. It finally dawns on him that the voice was probably right, and they should go back. Sarah encourages him not to lose hope, but to persist in reaching the light. She reminds Boyd that if he gives up, he will never see his son again. Upon hearing this, Boyd gets up and pushes forward. On the other hand, Jade shares his idea with Jim. Even though they can't plug in any wires, they can use the lamps to get electricity. He unscrews the bulb, attaches the cord of the hair dryer to the socket, and then replaces the bulb. When he turns on the light, the hair dryer starts working, finally putting an end to their electricity hunt. However, they still need enough wires to run from the lamps inside the colony house out to the radio and the tower. Jade addresses the townspeople and instructs them to gather anything with a cord that arrived in town in the back of someone's car. Upon hearing this, everybody sets out for the wire hunt. Christy takes charge of the ambulance outside the clinic, which turns out to be a treasure trove of wires. Christy is salvaging electrical components when Kenny joins her. When asked about his lamp, Kenny pops open the globe, which he used as a hidden compartment to stash stuff. Inside the globe, Kenny has a list of places he wants to visit upon returning home. When Christy shares her desire to visit Iceland, he suggests they go together. Noticing Kenny's liking for her, Christy admits that she likes him too, but informs him that she is engaged and there is someone waiting for her back home. The situation gets awkward, and Kenny leaves the place to transport some wires to the colony house. Meanwhile, the tower is completed, and transported to the roof of the colony house through a hoisting system. Jim demonstrates to Ethan how to change the electrical frequency with a screwdriver. While people work on the project, Jade brings some snacks, jokingly mentioning that if anyone makes a mistake, they will have to spend the night in the box. Later, Christy joins Kenny in the colony house. Kenny apologizes for making things awkward between them. Christy admits to feeling torn between the most amazing guy ever and the lover she left behind. When he asks about her plan, Christy responds that she doesn't know. Jim finishes assembling the radio set while Jade works on the tower. With both products now completed, the people are pleased to have accomplished half the work. The next phase of the project involves the power supply. Several residents light the lamps before activating the coil to power the radio. When the radio springs to life, everyone celebrates their success. Tabitha embraces Jim before returning to dig a hole in the basement. All seems well, until one resident alerts everyone about an approaching storm. On the other hand, Boyd is too tired to walk. As the storm approaches, they climb the mountainside. Reaching a higher point, they survey the surroundings and discover that the light is coming from a lighthouse. Meanwhile, Jim attempts to catch a signal by adjusting the frequencies. Donna warns that the storm will hit in 10 minutes, but Jim insists on working while she is more concerned about the resident's safety. As Jim tries to shield the components with an umbrella, the storm intensifies. Everyone hurries inside to seek shelter, but Jim persists in his efforts until he finally manages to connect with a man on the other side of the radio. To his astonishment, the man addresses him by name. When Jim inquires about the man's identity, 
The man warns him that Tabitha shouldn't be digging that hole in the basement. Realizing that Tabitha's life is in danger, Jim rushes to the town, asking Donna to take care of his kids. As Donna heads inside, the light bulbs start exploding. On the other hand, Tabitha continues digging the hole until the concrete base collapses. Falling into the large pit, she discovers a bare electrical wire with no connections, leaving her stunned. As she remains stuck, Victor approaches her, claiming that the boy in the white dress informed him that she would come. He urges Tabitha to leave with him, explaining that it's where the monsters sleep during the day. Victor then shows her a painting on the wall created by the monsters. Just before the floor can collapse further, Victor successfully guides Tabitha away from the danger. When Jim reaches the house, he finds that even the floor has collapsed. Meanwhile, Boyd is in intense pain, making it impossible for him to walk any further. He urges Sarah to go on without him, suggesting that one of them should return to town to inform people about the lighthouse. At that moment, Sarah spots a boy in a white dress, who guides her to use the faraway tree to escape the situation. Following the instructions, Sarah helps Boyd into the tree, assuring him that she will follow. As the series concludes, Boyd finds himself transported to a cramped room, where he can't even sit. He calls for help, but no one responds, leaving us wondering how he'll escape this predicament, and where this place actually exists, in the town, or the outside world. Additionally, who was on the radio with Jim adds to the mysteries yet to be revealed.